Hello, um, my name is Luis Montolio from the National Center for Biotechnology in Madrid. And uh, I would like to thank Pilar Iñiguez for this new invitation. Unfortunately, I cannot be with you, but I'm recording this uh, webinar. And should you have any questions, I would be more than happy to respond by email. So without further delay, so let's get started with uh, my presentation. So this is about CRISPR sequences, future perspectives, and I will put uh, an angle on the role of patents on the patent field in the CRISPR technology. As you know, CRISPR are everywhere. This is a technology that has spread throughout the world through different disciplines, biology, biomedicine, biotechnology, and uh, this is probably thanks also to these two researchers. On the left, Emmanuel Charpentier. This is a French microbiologist working in Berlin. And on the right, Jennifer Downer, and she's a biochemist. Uh, she's working at the University of California in Berkeley. They were awarded uh, last year, October 2020, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the development of a method for genome editing. This uh, underlines the fact that the CRISPR-Cas technology is not the only technology we knew about genome editing. Actually, there were three former technologies, all the technologies that didn't make it or were not as successful as CRISPR, such as the meganuclease, the zinc finger nuclease, or the talent. So for the rest of my talk, I will focus on the CRISPR-Cas technology. As you know, the CRISPR, they were initially discovered as a system, as a defense system in bacteria. And actually they were discovered where you are, in Alicante, at the University of Alicante. And this is thanks to the work of Francisco Juan Martinez Mojica. And he is a macrobiologist. And he was the one that realizes that uh, some of these bacteria and archaea, in general prokaryotes, they have this peculiar organization in their genome with repeated sequences, these diamonds, that are separated with, those, with these rectangles that are different one to another. Eventually, Francis discovered that these rectangles, they are representing pieces of uh, viral genomes for which the bacteria is resistant. So as soon as a bacteria is, cap cap uh, is uh, capturing some uh, uh, pieces of the viral genome, then the bacteria become resistant to the infection. So it's a true immune system, it's a true defense system. Further, Francis uh, coined the, the popular name that is in the mouth of everyone at the moment, that is CRISPR. CRISPR is a fabulous and very successful acronym and it stands for Cluster Regularly Interspace Short Palindromic Repeats, which is what we are seeing. So from the studies in prokaryotes, eventually this technology was moved into the eukaryotes and the same proteins that um, prokaryotes are serving the bacteria to defend themselves from uh, bacteriophages, from virus, in eukaryotes, we can use them as genome editing tools because basically they cut DNA and upon cutting DNA, and this is kind of a basic mechanism that I have to explain in order to understand what I will be talking later on. Once the CRISPR-Cas technology is used to cut uh, your favorite gene, and it does a double strand break in the DNA in the genome, then the cell has to repair. So because without repairing, then the cell has a problem and may lose a piece of this chromosome. There is a default pathway on the left, which is the non-homologous enjoining, which is progressing by adding and removing nucleotides and hoping that there will be a, some microhomology that eventually will be able to, res, to rescue the physical uh, continuity of the chromosome. Of course, because we have inserting and deleting indels, the normal outcome of this uh, pathway would be gene disruption. And today, this is the easiest way of uh, altering a gene, of mutating a gene. On the right, there is another repair mechanism, which is the homology-driven repair, in which you can provide an extra DNA molecule, single strand or double strand, that has homology to left and right 
of the double strand break. And eventually you can promote as a template, you can promote the use of this template for the repairing and thereby you can introduce new nucleotides that were there before. And this is what we normally understand as gene editing. Well, the genome editing tools, they can be used for deleting DNA, for inserting DNA, for replacing DNA, for modifying DNA, for labeling, for modulating transcriptions, for targeting RNA, etc. you name it. So basically the limit is in the imagination of the researchers. And then the applications, they are all in biology, in research and development, in human medicine and biomedicine, biotechnology, agriculture. I will give you a couple of examples. So altogether, these are the more or less the, uh, the fundamental applications. And I'm sort of highlighting human gene therapy probably is one of the, of the most uh, expected applications that, uh, that uh, we are hoping to be using through this CRISPR cas but not to forget agriculture, not to forget ecological vector control, not to forget viral gene disruption as a pathogen gene disruption, and etc. So I will give you some examples of this. So the reality is that during 20 years, between 93 and 2013, there will be, or there were these uh, researchers, and I'm sort of selecting 12 that were really engaged in developing these techniques. And this has a lot of relevance for the patents and for who has the rights, who is owning the rights of this technology. Of course, as you see up in the, in the, in the top at the, uh, at the left is Francis. Francis is number one, Francis Mojica, who is putting everyone else on the same track to, to develop these technologies. And we have uh, four macrobiologists, the central people that uh, propose to convert these defense systems into a genome editing tools. And the four last uh, researchers that really demonstrated that this uh, defense system are actually working as genome editing tools. Well, the central are the two researchers, the ones that were awarded the Nobel Prize, because they proposed in June 2012 that these defense systems could be used the ones for, for genome editing technologies. But also not to forget a Lithuanian microbiologist, Virginis Signis, that he also came up with the same idea, but somehow he didn't manage to publish the, his paper in time. And this is why most, if not all of the credit goes to Charpentier and Duna, and not many people remember Cygnus. And I think this needs to be corrected. And this is why I'm naming this person here. Eventually, January 2013, two researchers, Feng Zhang from the Broad Institute and George Church from Harvard University, both in Boston, they confirmed that the proposals from the two researchers from Chapanti and Duna were right, and they confirmed that they could uh, apply these tools for genome editing. So basically, this is just to, to, rem to remember that even though Down and Charpentier were awarded the Nobel Prize for proposing the idea, the real demonstration, the real experiment in which CRISPR-Cas reagents were used for genome editing was carried out by these two other <coughs> researchers, excuse, excuse me, such as on the left, Feng Zhang, and on the right, <coughs> George Church. There are other researchers that, uh, that they played an important role, and I will be referring to, to them later on in my talk, such as Luciano Marrafini, is an Argentinian researcher that eventually ended up working at the Rockefeller University in New York. And last but not least, I would like to refer to David Liu and his new variants, because David Liu has also been playing an important role in the new variants of CRISPR and the new applications. Well, all these researchers, besides their basic science compromise, <coughs> they had also additional interest in as entrepreneurs in uh, founding and uh, supporting the development of different companies. And I want to highlight this because 
the names of the companies will appear later on and you need to associate these companies with the corresponding researchers. Well, one of the first companies that was um, originated in Boston around the Broad Institute was Editas Medicine. And among the founders, you will find Feng Zhang, George Church, Kit Yang, and David Liu. Feng Zhang himself, he was also founding two further companies, Sherlock Biosciences for diagnostic tools and Arbor Technologies for using some variants of nuclease gas that he was discovering as well. Jennifer Downer, initially uh, she founded together with the University of California in Berkeley, Caribou Biosciences, and later on, uh, she was involved in Mammut Biosciences, which is also with some interest in, in diagnostics, and lately also in Intelia, Intelia Therapeutics, that uh, you will see that uh, she's also playing a good example in therapy. Emmanuel Charpentier, perhaps the most uh, successful of all these different companies, she alone, she decided to go differently and she founded two related companies, CRISPR Therapeutics and ERS Genomics. CRISPR Therapeutics is taking care of all the therapies developments for human treatments and for the remaining applications, which are non-human related, such as animals, such as academies, such as plants, such as any other organism. This is why she founded ERS. Uh, genomics. And finally, last but not least, BIM Therapeutics is a, it was an idea from David Liu and, uh, they were, and it was joined by Kit Yang and Feng Zhang. The three of them, they work uh, in Boston and BIM Therapeutics is taking care of the base editors and the prime editors, which are the latest variants of the CRISPR-Cas uh, tools. So let's, let's go step by step in the history of the publications which have uh, an important role regarding the pattern. So this is the paper that, uh, uh, that was resulting in the Nobel Award for Charpentier and Downer. They suggested in this paper in Science that was published online on, at the end of June, so 28th of June, that uh, they could use this uh, CRISPR-Cas system from a uh, pathogenic bacteria, Streptococcus pyogenes, and convert it into a genome editing tool. Please pay attention to the dates. The paper was sent 8th of June, was accepted 12 days later, probably the fastest acceptance of such a complex paper. It was accepted on the 20th of June and appeared right away on the 28th of June, and eventually published in mid-August. So this is the paper that eight years later brought these two researchers the Nobel Prize. The, the paper was presenting the original CRISPR-Cas system in which uh, there is a Cas9 nuclease, this, uh, this, yellow, this yellow figure, this yellow ellipsis, in which uh, this is a nuclease that is cutting DNA, is producing the double strand break, and it's cutting somewhere in the genome, which is guided by the RNA. This is a blue molecule. And this is a fusion of several smaller RNA molecules. And this is so-called uh, synthetic guide RNA or sgRNA. So this is what in 2012 was presented and proposed by Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Downer. But uh, we shouldn't forget this other paper from the lab of Virginius Signis in Lithuania in Vilnius University. Please pay attention. The paper was sent on the 21st of May, which means two weeks before the paper that was sent by uh, Dauna and Charpentier to Science. So this paper should have been first published, but eventually Instead of this, this paper was delayed and the paper appeared published on the 1st of August. Well, now it has been publicly known that these uh, authors, they decided to submit this paper to PNAS after testing with other journals that they were not interested in publishing this paper. And when they submitted to PNAS, this paper ended up in the hands of Jennifer Downer. So, and she claims uh, she was not uh, touching the paper. She was, of course, 
uh, claiming that she had a conflict of interest, but nonetheless, I think this has to be underlined that the paper was uh, sent to Jennifer Downer and for whatever reasons, the paper got delayed and was accepted in August and published 4 of September, which is uh, almost um, two and a half months after the science paper was published. And this is why we all remember and congratulate Downer and Charpentier, and we forget about this paper, which is not exactly the same findings, but this paper was also suggesting that uh, we could convert the CRISPR-Cas system in bacteria uh, as a genome editing tool. So this is something to be taken into account. So where the demonstrations came? So there were two demonstrations that were published by Feng Zhang and George Church. These are two independent labs in Boston. Feng Zhang working at the Broad Institute with the MIT. This uh, Feng Zhang paper was sent in October, beginning of October, accepted in beginning of December, and eventually published online on the first days in January 2013. The same happens for George Church, that uh, he works at the Harvard University. He sent uh, the paper a few days later, but was accepted on the same day, beginning of December, 12th of December, and was published online beginning of January. Jennifer Downer, she wanted to be also first, but she failed. And uh, this is the, uh, the paper. So they sent a paper to eLife on beginning of December. The paper was accepted on the same day the other two papers were published online. So Jennifer Downer's demonstration of genome editing tool application was accepted on the 3rd of January and published at the end of this month. So this was like uh, one month uh, later. So basically, this is why we need to acknowledge Charpentier and Duna proposal to convert the immune defense system into a genome editing tool. But we need to acknowledge as well that, do, that uh, Church and Zhang were the two researchers that were confirming this. Well, this has implications regarding the patents. The first CRISPR patent field of a file was by Downer and Charpentier and other collaborators. And that was uh, filed by the University of California, but Emmanuel Charpentier herself and the University of Vienna. And that was filed on 25th of May, but it was not published until the 18th of February, 2016. And so far, believe it or not, this patent has not been granted. So this patent still been under investigation, under, under review. So this was the first pattern and that was, that was filed like uh, one month before the publication appeared online in science. However, the first CRISPR pattern granted was not from Charpentier and Donna, rather it was from, from Feng Zhang. Feng Zhang at the Broad, he filed the patent on the 12th of December, 2012, and eventually he got it granted on the 15th of April, 2014. And there were two reasons for it. First, because at the time, the, you remember, this is no longer the case. Now US Patent Office is operating under the same rules as the European Patent Office. So, which means first to file is first to then. In, at the time, uh, it was not first to file, it was first to demonstrate. And because uh, the patent from Charpentier and Downer was not demonstrating genome editing activities, but Feng Zhang was. And then this is why Feng Zhang patent was granted. And also because the broad, they played the game because the, there is a fast track procedure. You pay a few dollars, and then you have your patent, which is rapidly being evaluated. Of course, you risk that if you fail in this process, you will be dropping your application, but they made sure that the patent was perfectly presented. They had a, an army of lawyers probably. And this is why eventually, even though the patent was presented almost half a year later, actually half a year later, they got the patent granted first. And this was the beginning 
of, of the war. So this was the beginning of the battle because as you can imagine, the University of California considered this was an, uh, an, uh, an aggression that uh, they were being scooped, that the brood was interfering with their former uh, patent application. So nowadays what we're using is what you're seeing in this slide and everything you see is recombinant and everything you see is commercial. So the Cas9 is a recombinant protein. You can purchase through different companies, different providers and the CRISPR and the tracer RNA are the two small molecules that are also from chemical synthesis. And this is basically what we're using at the moment. So how do we purchase and how, what can we do with the reagents we purchase? Well, we need to purchase CRISPR reagents from authorized providers such as uh, Gene, uh, IDT, or Merck Sigma, or Thermo Fishers, and others. What can we do and in the academia? So for academic use, these CRISPR reag reagents are fine, so not a problem. And also for not-for-profit academic services for users belonging to the same institutions. But however, what can we not do? So we cannot use these reagents for industrial or commercial use, and we cannot use this for profit, profit academic services, particularly when we are providing these services to external users belonging to other institutions. And this needs to be very clear, which means we have to negotiate if we want to go commercial, if we want to provide services to users beyond our institution, we have to negotiate a non-exclusive user license. We have to pay an annual fee for using this CRISPR technology. We have to open up our books and share our business plan. We have to pay royalties, which will be a percentage of our, of our for profit fees. And we have uh, to create an insurance for potential claims that might be presented and sued by third parties. But with whom do we have to establish this non-exclusive user license? Well, this is the main problem. So this was last year and this, the, the whole picture and the whole scenario hasn't changed much. So we have uh, a battle that has been going on between the East Coast and the West Coast. The East Coast being the Broad Institute at the MIT and the West Coast being the University of California in Berkeley. And apparently there is, a, there is someone winning. The winner is the Broad Institute, at least in the US. You will see that this is not the case in Europe and the thing has not changed much. So basically, if we have a quick summary of uh, developments, as you can see, we compare the patents from Broad and from Berkeley, the with they both were filed in 2012, the broad in December, the Berkeley in May. The paper for the broad was published January 2013. The paper for the Berkeley was published, I mean printed in August 20, 2012. And of course they, they, they filed an interference in January 2016. Why they filed this interference, Berkeley? Because the, in April 2014, the patent, the CRISPR patent was granted to the broad. And uh, the title or the claims for the broad is for the CRISPR applications in all eukaryotic cells. Whereas the patent from Berkeley, it's kind of a wider, wider uh, room and has uh, CRISPR applications in all types of cells, that is including prokaryotes and eukaryotes, but still under evaluation. Eventually, the interference was um, uh, denied in February 2017, and Berkeley also was claiming again against uh, Broad and these um, these patents, these patents uh, um, committee was ruling in favor of Broad <clears throat> again in September 2020. So I don't think Berkeley will give up. So we could, they will continue fight in order to to eventually get what they think are the rights, but uh, this is the situation we have at the moment. In the US, the winner is the broad, the MIT. And as you can see, the priority of uh, these technologies in Europe eventually turned to be to the University of California and to Charpentier. So basically this is the two situations we have. 
So this is pretty much what uh, I just said. This is kind of a, a calendar um, of events regarding these different publications. And eventually this is the lesson that we have to understand. So uh, in January, 2020, the broad pattern was lost in Europe because eventually uh, the, uh, the European Patent Office, they decided it was lacking novelty. And it was lacking novelty because the paper and the patent was published later after the publication from Charpentier and Dunga. And remember, and in Europe, what applies is not first to demonstrate, but first to file. And was first to file the corresponding from the University of California in Berkeley. Further, the broad MIT, probably they committed a mistake because you remember Luciano Marraffini, this Argentinian, they included initially Luciano Marraffini in the US patent. Eventually they delete his name and also they delete his name in the European patent. And then the European patent office, they realized there were different inventors for the same patent and they were denying this patent. So the summary is that in the US, the broad has the rights for the CRISPR technology. And in Europe, the University of California, Berkeley is the one leading. So the US is the broad and in Europe is the combination of University of California, Charpentier and University of Vienna that are owning the rights. Well, this is a bit complex and this means that anyone willing to use this technology and willing to operate both in Europe and in the US will have to negotiate and purchase not one, but two non-exclusive licenses, which is a bit complicated and which probably is turning down some companies that they don't have the capacity for doing this. So this is becoming very complicated. This is from 2018. And as you can see the different uh, alliances and the different collaborations between a number of different companies. This is a bit, uh, uh, a bit more updated. This is from April 2019. And as you can see in different concentric circles, you can see the main companies and the owners of the, of the rights and how the different applications are being distributed among the different companies. This is just uh, as an example of what I was telling you, the, uh, the ownership of the patents is corresponding to Emmanuel Charpentier and Emmanuel Charpentier has given exclusive rights to two license holders, ERS genomics for all fields except human therapeutics and CRISPR therapeutics for all human therapeutics. And the same goes for Intelia therapeutics that is kind of an spin-off from Caribou Biosciences. I will come back to these companies later on. So these are some examples of non-exclusive license from uh, last year. And as you will see, there are very few public institutions, only the German Helmut Centrum, which is similar to the CSIC here in Spain, and the British MRC, which is similar to the Instituto de Salud Carlos III here in Spain. And the rest are more or less companies, for-profit companies that they have these alliances. Well, this is a real complex scenario. And then I guess the universities are beginning to realize that this is not um, really being really helpful for, for, for many applications. And this is why, for instance, the University of Wageningen in the Netherlands, they decided to open up their CRISPR patents for free to third countries and to non, non to poor countries where they cannot afford to purchase and to subscribe these license fees. And this is just to, to make sure that uh, democratically they can also access to this technology. And I think this is worth highlighting. And this, is, this was done just one month ago in September 2021. So the number of patents is enormous. It's over 6,000 patents that are now in accumulated probably more. And um, if you, there is a kind of a bias because basically all CRISPR patents, all thousands of patents are accumulated in United States and China with a bit of uh, the patents uh, in, uh, in Europe. And as you will see, the remaining countries with very few patents. If we take into account what type of applications are being 
name in these patents. Most of the patents, they are related with technical improvements, 45%, followed by medical applications and by plan applications. And as you will see, the development of, pat uh, of patents goes uh, with a pace with a very, uh, very increased curves for United States and China and Europe is following well, well below. Examples of these patents, for instance, in the plants is the company DuPont, uh, together with Pioneer, that they have used CRISPR to produce the waxy mutant. And this is a maize mutant in which they produce basically uh, 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 a grain that has almost 90% 97% amylopectin and almost no amylose, which means it's better for food and for industrial derivatives such as other sieves that are being obtained from this plant. In Europe, we have a problem. And as you know, in 25th of July, there was a sentence from the Court of Justice of the European Union in which they conclude that genome edited organisms are regulated as GMO because they're similar to transgenic. Well, this is scientifically nonsense. This was absurd. Maybe this has some uh, uh, legal explanation, but th this has no scientific explanation. So basically they concluded in 2018 that uh, edited organisms, they need to be treated like GMOs and the directive 2001-18, they need to be applied, which means that they need to undergo all these different tests for toxicity and tests for quality and et cetera, which are very costly in the terms of years and in terms of euros that need to be invested. It is nonsense because a transgenic is adding a transgene, a piece of DNA to a pre-existing organism. And this is what we call a transgenic plan or a transgenic uh, organism. When we're talking about varieties or races, we, uh, we're referring to, to organisms that they carry the same gene, perhaps with a different letter somewhere in the gene. Of course, these are not transgenic, but when we apply CRISPR, CRISPR is, is, can be used to change one letter to the other. And by changing this letter, we are editing the genome. We are not creating a transgenic organism. So a genome editor organism is not a transgenic organism. So there is a number of scientists that have been uh, claiming that this was not justified. And uh, the European Commission had to reply with, uh, with an updated report. It was due until the end of April. Eventually, they published the report on 29th of April, and they had to recognize that the current directive probably does not uh, fully apply with uh, genome edited, that they had to investigate, that probably they will need to update, and they will be opening a new, a new chain or a new round of conversations. So basically, not much has happened. Europe is still blocking the development of this uh, genome edited organism. And we cannot produce these different varieties in which only one letter is different. And this is resulting in a phenotypic differences. This is what can be done elsewhere, but not in Europe. In, uh, if we compare classic genetics, when we're moving a, a, a trait from, uh, from a variety to a variety through subsequent breeding steps, this takes for ages, this takes for many years. Whereas with the new mutagenesis techniques, we can go directly with CRISPR. And this is something that we can apply and we can segregate and we can produce very, very neatly. Well, the other thing we need to take into account is that Europe is always taking care of uh, paying attention to the procedure. And as you can see, either by radioactivity, by chemical mutagenesis, by CRISPR, or by using based editors, we are able to change the same letter, an A to a G and the resulting product is absolutely indistinguishable. And if it's indistinguishable, it's very hard to apply any rule or any law because there is no way we can tell whether CRISPR or whether radiation or whether chemical mutagenesis have been used. So this is why we, we, need, to, we need to reflect on, on this idea. And also we need to remember that we're living in a global world and we need to realize that Europe is just a small corner. For instance, as you will see in the entire world is only Europe that uh, together with New Zealand, 
that uh, is regulating genome edited crops as GMOs, whereas in the rest of the world, they are not being treated like that and they can be grown and they can be produced. So we will not be able to produce, but we will have to purchase the products that will be produced elsewhere. One of the latest examples is this Japanese company that has produced this uh, genome edited tomato that has increased levels of GABA and that has uh, good consequences, good health, because it can help to, to lower the blood uh, pressure. This is a tomato that will be uh, commercialized in Japan. And uh, regarding biomedicine, we have uh, 51 clinical trials today with CRISPR. Most of them are ex vivo, which means you have to take cells from the person, from the patient, you can edit in the lab, and then you can return. And whereas in vivo, you can deliver the CRISPR reagents directly to the patient. And uh, the first application for CRISPR was for cancer immunotherapy, for melanomas, for sarcomas, and for myelomas, in which uh, these are patients that uh, were not responding to chemotherapy and to radiotherapy. And uh, T lymphocytes, uh, white blood cells, we obtain it and using CRISPR, there was a gene PD-1 being removed. So that is making stronger these lymphocytes and there was uh, the T cell receptor was converted into a chimeric receptor, which is able to fight uh, better to the cancer cells. And this is probably what we will hear a lot in the clinical setup. Also, probably the, the best success so far for CRISPR technologies in biomedicine is this treatment for sickle cell anemia or beta thalassemia. This is for substituting the mutated beta globin. Beta globin is the beta chain of the hemoglobin, transporting oxygen from the lungs to the cells of our body. And in this case, what they are doing is applying CRISPR to repress a repressor the repressor that maintains the gamma globin, which is a substitute for beta globin. Gamma globin is normally expressed during fetal development, but in the adulthood is being silenced. It's silenced by this repressor. But if we inactivate the repressor with CRISPR, we can awake the gamma globin and gamma globin can substitute the beta globin. And this is what happened to this patient. This is Victoria Gray, was treated in July, 2019. And as you can see, the green bars, which is beta globin are substituted 18 months later by the blue bars, which is gamma globin. So she was needing one or two transfusions of blood per week. Now she's fully cured. She's probably one of the best successes. So as you can see, it's CRISPR therapeutics that is involved. Now we have editors that are involved in the treatment of this uh, neurodegenerative disease for retinal. This is liver congenital amaurosis. And this is, this is uh, uh, a way of injecting intravitreal, so intraocular subretinally to remove one mutation that is included in this gene that is causing this disease. And then we have the very first results been just released. This is very preliminary, even though in some newspapers they have, they have converted this, this very cautious uh, press release into something which is not yet actually, not yet actually true. Most of these um, companies are using adeno-associated virus as the shuttles, as the vehicles to to transfer these CRISPR reagents. And the difference was from this company, Intelia, for treating, for treating this rare disease. This Intelia is also associated with Jennifer Downer, and this is treating transthyretin amyloidosis. They first tested this in mice, and basically they killed the gene, and they removed the production of the protein that was accumulating and was, was being toxic. So basically, this is... Um, this was in October, but in June this summer, they have released uh, a new update in which they are using uh, lipid nanoparticles or nanotechnology to distribute these CRISPR reagents. And they are using this into non-human primates. And as you can see in the blue and the red bars, they reduce the amount of this toxic protein in plasma. And also they are testing in the first patients. And as you can see the curves, they are lowering. And then the last I would like to say is um, this, uh, maybe there is one or two or three minutes 
This is CRISPR in diagnostics, and this is CRISPR in COVID-19. Most of what I've said is uh, to cut and edit DNA, but CRISPR, they can also cut RNA. And this was found by Feng Zhang. Feng Zhang was found a nuclease that was cutting RNA guided by another small molecule of RNA. But what happens is that this nuclease, when it was found in the cognate, the complementary, was, uh, was running crazy and was kind of digesting every RNA in the mixture. Then Feng Zhang decided to put some molecules, some traces with fluorescence markers that would be illuminated when this finding will be occurring. So basically it was converting this into a diagnostic system. So this was followed by a similar development from Jennifer Downer, and this was converted into this chemical lateral flow. This is similar to the antigen a test that we are using or the predictor test for pregnancy test. And in March 2020, this Feng Zhang was sort of the first that was uh, releasing this, um, this first test for detecting the coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2, directly using CRISPR. And this was followed by Detector, which is the new system also prepared and presented by Jennifer Downer. So all these CRISPR tests, they are faster, simpler, less, uh, somehow less sensitive, but they are qualitative and not quantitative. But they are much, much simpler. They don't require PCR, they don't require robots, they don't require uh, knowledge. So the simplest of these procedures was presented by Feng Zhang on the 5th of May. And as you can see, you only need pipettes and, uh, and uh, some uh, heater for maintaining the, the temperature and in 30 minutes or less, you get uh, the result. And this is something you can bring to anywhere. So this is uh, something you can put uh, at uh, any point of care. And this is why the FDA at the 8th of May, 2020 was granting this first approval to this Sherlock Biosciences, which is the company associated with Feng Zhang. This is approved and this is being used in the US, but this is not approved, not being used in Europe. Jennifer Downer, after winning the Nobel Award, was presenting a new development, which was even uh, faster, which was converting this fluorescence into, uh, that can be run into a tube and the fluorescence, the light that was produced in the presence of the coronavirus, they could be detected by the camera of the iPhone, of the cellular phone. So basically, uh, using many different guides, you can produce many different fluorescence. And last but not least, you can apply CRISPR to delete the genome of the coronavirus because there are some nucleases such as Cas13D that they can digest the RNA. And this is exactly the genome of the coronavirus. So, and this is specifically, and this is something that has been already explored in um, in a, in a model, in a theoretical way, and also in a practical way with another acronym, which is also very ingenious, which is PACPAN. And this was done by Stan, in Stanford University for treating both coronavirus and the influenza virus. And the last that I would like to show is that this is also being explored in mice and in hamsters in different rodents for the treatment of influenza and also the COVID-19. We are doing the same and we are using ribonucleoproteins. We want to use this protein together with the RNA to be used as an antiviral to kill the coronavirus. And we are using the guides against some of the conserved genes of this coronavirus. So this is the team that we have been applying this technique these are virologists, these are experts in CRISPR-Cas, and these are members of my team that have been founded by these companies that have donated funds for research at the CSIC. The other thing you need to take into account regarding patents is that there are many more CRISPR-Cas systems yet to be discovered. In 50% um, of archaea, of bacteria and 80% of archaea, and the latest, uh, the latest reviews, they talk about many different classes and many different CRISPR-Cas systems. And each one of these CRISPR-Cas, they might as be associated with different families of patents. So the whole picture of patents is getting very, very, very complex. 
And what I told you before it was only applying basically for the CRISPR-Cas9, which was the original system. So the, the oldest CRISPR-Cas were known very recently, and I was commenting on them as the grand grandmothers of this CRISPR-Cas. So basically there is many, many to be investigated for, for on this on these different CRISPR cas So I'm finishing in 45 minutes, maybe five minutes extra. And excuse me for this game being a bit longer, but I wanted to present all these different data and by just acknowledging people in my group and the different uh, uh, companies and associations and uh, foundations and uh, that are providing us funds. And I will finish with a very strong recommendation for all of you if you are interested in this field. So there are, to my knowledge, there are five books that have been published on CRISPR, and I really recommend you to reading them all because they are both, they are all giving different perspectives and different ideas. I brought myself one of these books, Editando Genes, Recorta Pegue Colorea. It was first published in February, 2019. We have a third edition now published in March 2021, but there are four other books that, as you can see, from Jennifer Downer, from Kiran Musunuru, from Kevin Davis and Walter Isaacson, that basically are worth reading and will provide you with a better perspective of the entire scenario of CRISPR. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, you can also always drop me an email. Bye-bye.